Hi there. There. Okay. I think we are almost at seven o'clock. We are definitely getting there. Oh, yes. Hi! <laughs> it is story time with Chris Stalky again. Uh, welcome. If you are just joining me for the first time, um, I had an overwhelming response, as far as I'm concerned, of my first reading of the first three chapters of C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew on, uh, uh, I believe it was Monday evening. Um, uh, almost 350 views. Wow. And for all of those that shared that video, thank you. Um, you can always also, while, while you're watching this, you can actually start a watch party so that everybody on your Facebook uh, friends list can automatically find it and tune in if they're paying attention to your news feed. So that's another way of doing this. If you um, uh, want to share, share. If you want to uh, start a watch party, start a watch party. Um, it's all good. <clears throat> so... A uh, little bit of a recap. Again, I am reading uh, C.S. Lewis's first book in his series, The Chronicles of Narnia, which is The Magician's Nephew. And I'm doing this in three chapter chunks uh, because it's about as long, I think, as anybody's attention span could go. And it's about as long as my voice can go. With uh, Monday night's video went almost an hour. So, um, yeah, it, it uh, takes a toll on your voice if you're doing that for an extended period of time, for sure. And it uh, makes me want to give props to every single actor, actress, um, anybody that does any live spoken word in any way, shape, or form. It takes a lot out of you. Um, at the end of Monday night, yep, yeah, my voice was tired. So there you go. Um, a little bit of a recap. So we've met Diggory, we've met Polly, and we've met... Uncle Andrew, and of course, um, some interesting and amazing things have happened in the first three chapters. Uh, and the children were about to jump into a pool that had no connection to their own world or the wood uh, between the worlds. And that's where we left them at the end of the third chapter. So here we go. This is chapter four, The Bell and the Hammer. There was no doubt about the magic this time. Down and down they rushed, first through darkness and then through a mass of vague and whirling shapes, which might have been almost anything. It grew lighter. Then suddenly they felt that they were standing on something solid. A moment later, everything came into focus and they were able to look about them. What a queer place, said Diggory. I don't like it, said Polly with something like a shudder. What they noticed first was the light. It wasn't like sunlight, and it wasn't like electric light or lamps or candles or any other light they had ever seen. It was a dull, rather red light. Not at all cheerful. It was steady and did not flicker. They were standing on a flat paved surface, and buildings rose all around them. There was no roof overhead. They were in a sort of courtyard. The sky was extraordinarily dark, a blue that was almost black. When you had seen that sky, you wondered that there should be any light at all. It's very funny weather here, said Diggory. I wonder if we've arrived just in time for a thunderstorm or an eclipse. I don't like it, said Polly. Both of them, without quite knowing why, were talking in whispers. And though there was no reason why they should still go on holding hands after their jump, they didn't let go. The walls rose very high all round that courtyard. They had many great windows in them, windows without glass, through which you saw nothing but black darkness. Lower down, there were great pillared arches yawning blackly like the mouths of railway tunnels. It was rather cold. The stone of which everything was built seemed to be red, but that might only be because of the curious light. It was obviously very old. Many of the flat stones that paved the courtyard had cracks across them. None of them fitted closely together, and the sharp corners were all worn off. 
One of the arch doorways was half filled up with rubble. The two children kept in turning around and round to look at the different sides of the courtyard. One reason was that they were afraid of somebody or something looking out of those windows at them when their backs were turned. Do you think anyone lives here, said Diggory at last, still in a whisper? No, said Polly, it's all in ruins. We haven't heard a sound since we came. Let's stand still and listen for a bit, suggested Diggory. They stood still and listened, but all they could hear was the thump, thump of their own hearts. This place was at least as quiet as the quiet wood between the worlds, but it was a different kind of quietness. The silence of the wood had been rich and warm. You could almost hear the trees growing and full of life. This was a dead, cold, empty silence. You couldn't imagine anything growing in it. Let's go home, said Polly. But we haven't seen anything yet, said Diggory. Now we're here, we simply must have a look around. I'm sure there's nothing at all interesting here. There's not much point in finding a magic ring that lets you into other worlds if you're afraid to look at them when you've got there. Who's talking about being afraid, said Polly, letting go of Diggory's hand. I only thought you didn't seem very keen on exploring this place. I'll go anywhere you go. We can get away the moment we want to, said Diggory. Let's take off our green rings and put them in our right-hand pockets. All we've got to do is to remember that our yellows are in our left-hand pockets. You can keep your hand as near your pocket as you like, but don't put it in, or you'll touch your yellow and vanish. They did this and went quietly up to one of the big arched doorways which led into the inside of the building. And when they stood on the threshold and could look in, they saw it was not so dark inside as they had thought at first. It led into a vast shadowy hall, which appeared to be empty, but on the far side there was a row of pillars with arches between them, and through those arches there streamed in some more of the same tired-looking light. They crossed the hall, walking very carefully for fear of holes in the floor, or of anything lying about that they might trip over. It seemed a long walk. When they had reached the other side, they came out through the arches and found themselves in another and larger courtyard. That doesn't look very safe, said Polly, pointing at a place where the wall bulged outward and looked as if it were ready to fall over into the courtyard. In one place, a pillar was missing between two arches, and the bit that came down to where the top of the pillar ought to have been hung there with nothing to support it. Clearly, the place had been deserted for hundreds, perhaps thousands, of years. If it's lasted till now, I suppose it'll last a bit longer, said Diggory. But we must be very quiet. You know, a noise sometimes brings things down, like an avalanche in the Alps. They went on out out of that courtyard into another doorway and up a great flight of steps and through vast rooms that opened out of one another till you were dizzy with the mere size of the place. Every now and then they thought they were going to get out into the open and see what sort of country lay around the enormous palace. But each time they only got into another courtyard. They must have been magnificent places when people were still living there. In one, there had been uh, once a fountain. A great stone monster with widespread wings stood with its mouth open, and you could still see a bit of piping at the back of its mouth, out of which the water used to pour. Under it was a wide stone basin to hold the water, but it was dry as a bone. In other places, there were the dry sticks of some sort of climbing plant, which had wound itself round the pillars and helped to pull some of them down, but it had died long ago. And there were no ants or spiders or any of other living things you would expect to see in a ruin. And where the dry earth showed between the broken flagstones, there was no grass or moss. It was all so dreary and all so much the same that even Diggory was thinking they had better put on their yellow rings and get back to the warm, green, living forest of the in-between place when they came to two huge doors of some metal that might possibly be gold. One stood a little ajar. So, of course, they went to look in. Both started back and drew a long breath, for here, at last, was something worth seeing. For a second, they thought the room was full of people, hundreds of people, all seated and all perfectly still. Polly and Diggory, as you may guess, stood perfectly still themselves for a good long time looking in. 
But presently they decided that what they were looking at could not be real people. They, there was not a movement nor the sound of a breath among them all. They were like the most wonderful waxworks you ever saw. This time, Polly took the lead. There was something in this room which interested her more than it interested Diggory. All the figures were wearing magnificent clothes. If you were interested in clothes at all, you could hardly help going in to see them closer. And the blaze of their colors made this room look not exactly cheerful, but at any rate rich and majestic after all the dust and emptiness of the others. It had more windows, too, and was a good deal lighter. I can hardly describe the clothes. The figures were all robed and had crowns on their heads. Their robes were of crimson and silvery gray and deep purple and vivid green, and there were patterns and pictures of flowers and strange beasts and needlework all over them. Precious stones of astonishing size and brightness stared from their crowns and hung in chains round their necks and peeped out from all the places where anything was fastened. Why haven't these clothes all rotted away long ago? asked Polly. Magic, whispered Diggory. Can't you feel it? I bet this whole room is just stiff with enchantments. I could feel it in the moment we came in. Any one of these dresses could cost a hundreds of pounds, said Polly. But Diggory was more interested in the faces, and indeed these were well worth looking at. The people sat in their stone chairs on each side of the room, and the floor was left free down the middle. You could walk down and look at the faces in turn. They were nice people, I think, said Diggory. Polly nodded. All the faces they could see were certainly nice. Both the men and women looked kind and wise, and they seemed to come of a handsome race. But after the children had gone a few steps down the room, they came to some faces that looked a little different. These were very solemn faces. You felt you would have to mind your P's and Q's if you ever met living people who looked like that. When they had gone a little further, they found themselves among faces they didn't like. This was about the middle of the room. The faces here looked very strong and proud and happy, but they looked cruel. A little further on, they looked crueler. Further on, again, they were still cruel, but they no longer looked happy. They were even despairing faces, as if the people they belonged to had done dreadful things and also suffered dreadful things. The last figure of all was the most interesting, a woman even more richly dressed than the others, very tall, but every figure in that room was taller than the people of our world, with a look of such fierceness and pride that it took your breath away. Yet she was beautiful too. Years afterwards, when he was an old man, Diggory said he had never in all his life known a woman so beautiful. It is only fair to add that Polly always said she couldn't see anything especially beautiful about her. This woman, as I said, was the last, but there were plenty of empty chairs beyond her, as if the room had been intended for a much larger collection of images. I do wish we knew the story that's behind all this, said Diggory. Let's go back and look at the table sort of thing in the middle of the room. The thing in the middle of the room was not exactly a table. It was a square pillar about four feet high, and on it there rose a little golden arch from which there hung a little golden bell. And beside this, there lay a little golden hammer to hit the bell with. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder said Diggory. There seems to be something written here, said Polly, stooping down and looking at the side of the pillar. By gum, so there is, said Diggory. But of course we shan't be able to read it. Shan't we? I'm not so sure, said Polly. They both looked at it hard, and, as you might have expected, the letters cut in the stone were strange. But now a great wonder happened. For, as they looked, though the shape of the strange letters never altered, they found that they could understand them. If only Diggory had remembered what he himself had said a few minutes ago, that this was an enchanted room, he might have guessed that the enchantment was beginning to work. But he was too wild with curiosity to think about that. He was longing more and more to know what was written on the pillar, and very soon they both knew. What it said was something like this. At least this is the sense of it, though the poetry, when you read it there, was better. Make your choice, adventurous stranger. Strike the bell and bide the danger. 
or wonder till it drives you mad what would have followed if you had. No fear, said Polly. We don't want any danger. Oh, but don't you see it's no good, said Diggory. We can't get out of it now. We shall always be wondering what would have happened if we had struck the bell. I'm not going home to be driven mad by always thinking of that. No fear. Don't be so silly, said Polly, as if anyone would. What does it matter what would have happened? I expect anyone who's come as far as this is bound to go on wondering till it sends him dotty. That's the magic of it, you see. I can feel it beginning to work on me already. Well, I don't, said Polly crossly, and I don't believe you do either. You're just putting it on. That's all you know, said Diggory. It's because you're a girl. Girls never want to know anything but gossip and rot about people getting engaged. You looked exactly like your uncle when you said that, said Polly. Why can't you keep to the point, said Diggory. What we're talking about is how exactly like a man, said Polly in a very grown-up voice. But she added hastily in her real voice, and don't say I'm just a woman or you'll be a beastly copycat. I should never dream of calling a kid like you a woman, said Diggory loftily. Oh, I'm a kid, am I, said Polly, who was now in a real rage. Well, you needn't be bothered by having a kid with you any longer, then. I'm off. I've had enough of this place, and I've had enough of you, too, you beastly, stuck-up, obstinate pig. None of that, said Diggory, in a voice even nastier than he meant it to be, for he saw Polly's hand moving to her pocket to get hold of her yellow ring. I can't excuse what he did next, except by saying that he was very sorry for it afterwards, and so were a good many other people. Before Polly's hand reached her pocket, he grabbed her wrist, leaning across her with his back against her chest. Then, keeping her other arm out of the way with his other elbow, he leaned forward, picked up the hammer, and struck the golden bell a light, smart tap. Then he let her go, and they fell apart, staring at each other and breathing hard. Polly was just beginning to cry, not with fear, and not even because he had hurt her wrist quite fairly badly, but with furious anger. Within two seconds, however... They had something to think about that drove their own quarrels quite out of their minds. As soon as the bell was struck, it gave out a note, a sweet note, such as you might have expected, and not very loud. But instead of dying away again, it went on. And as it went on, it grew louder. Before a minute had passed, it was twice as loud as it had been to begin with. It was soon so loud that if the children had tried to speak... But they weren't thinking of speaking now. They were just standing with their mouths open. They would not have heard one another. Very soon it was so loud that they could not have heard one another even by shouting. And still it grew, all on one note, a continuous sweet sound, though the sweetness had something horrible about it, till all the air in that great room was throbbing with it, and they could feel the stone floor trembling under their feet. Then, at last, it began to be mixed with another sound, a vague, disastrous noise, which sounded first like the roar of a distant train, and then like the crash of a falling tree. They heard something like great weights falling, finally, with a sudden rush and thunder, and a shake that nearly flung them off their feet. About a quarter of the roof at one end of the room fell in, great blocks of masonry fell all around them, and the walls rocked. The noise of the bell stopped. The clouds of dust cleared away. Everything became quiet again. It was never found out whether the fall of the roof was due to magic or whether that unbearably loud sound from the bell just happened to strike the note which was more than those crumbling walls could stand. There, I hope you're satisfied now, panted Polly. Well, it's over anyway, said Diggory. And both thought it was, but they had never been more mistaken in their lives. And that's the end of that chapter. I'll take a quick drink. Ah, it is very dry in my apartment, so the drinks are absolutely necessary. Sorry for the break. But as I said uh, at the beginning of the video, um, to speak continuously is uh, a tax on anyone's voice. So it's good that I take little breaks. <clears throat> All right. Oh, and by the way, 
Uh, I meant to say this at the beginning. Um, I'm doing this out of the kindness of my heart, simply for entertainment purposes. But as an entertainer and a musician and a struggling musician in these times, um, uh, if you want to give me tips, tips would be nice. And if so, uh, you can please message me in uh, Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can also message me and uh, we'll try to contact one another and discuss that. Um, however, please do not feel obligated. Like I said, this is really out of the kindness of my heart because I love reading and I love storytelling and I think everyone needs a bit of a break from the usual, which for most people these days is watching whatever movies they can find on TV or um, Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever streaming service you happen to be um, subscribed to at the moment. But, you know, uh, it's fun to hear stories. And this is why I'm doing it. I used to do this for my little brother all the time and he loved it. So uh, there we are. Okay, are we ready for chapter five? The Deplorable Word. The children were facing one another across the pillar where the bell hung, still trembling, though it no longer gave out any note. Suddenly, they heard a no soft noise from the end of the room, which was still undamaged. They turned quick as lightning to see what it was. One of the robed figures, the furthest one off of all, the woman whom Diggory thought was so beautiful, was rising from its chair. When she stood up, they realized that she was even taller than they had thought, and you could see at once, not only from her crown and robes, but from the flash of her eyes and the curve of her lips, that she was a great queen. She looked round the room and saw the damage and saw the children, but you could not guess from her face what she thought of either or whether she was surprised. She came forward with long, strift strides. Who has awaked me? Who has broken the spell? she asked. I think it must have been me, said Diggory. You, said the queen, laying her hand on his shoulder, a white, beautiful hand, but Diggory could feel that it was strong as steel pincers. You, but you are only a child, a common child. Anyone can see at a glance that you have no drop of royal or noble blood in your veins. How did such as you dare to enter this house? We've come from another world, by magic, said Polly, who thought it was high time the queen took some notice of her as well as of Diggory. Is this true, said the queen, still looking at Diggory and not giving Polly even a glance. Yes, it is, said he. The queen put her other hand under his chin and forced it up so that she could see his face better. Diggory tried to stare back, but he soon had to let his eyes drop. There was something about hers that overpowered him. After she had studied him for well over a minute, she let go of his chin and said, You are no ma magician. The mark of it is not on you. You must only be the servant of a magician. It is on another's magic that you have traveled here. It was my uncle Andrew, said Diggory. At the moment, not in the room itself, but from somewhere very close, there came first a rumbling, then a creaking, and then a roar of falling masonry, and the floor shook. There is great peril here, said the queen. The whole palace is breaking up. If we are not out of it in a few minutes, we shall be buried under the ruin. She spoke as calmly as if she had been merely mentioning the time of day. Come, she added, and held out a hand to each of the children. Polly, who was disliking the queen and feeling sulky, would not have let her hand be taken if she could have helped it. But though the queen spoke so calmly, her movements were as quick as thought. Before Polly knew what was happening, her left hand had been caught in a hand so much longer and stronger than her own that she could do nothing about it. This is a terrible woman, thought Polly. She's strong enough to break my arm with one twist, and now that she's got my left hand, I can't get at my yellow ring. If I tried to stretch across and get my right hand into my left pocket, I mightn't be able to reach it before she asked me what I was doing. Whatever happens, we mustn't let her know about the rings. I do hope Diggory has the sense to keep his mouth shut. I wish I could get a word with him alone. The queen led them out of the Hall of Images into a long corridor and then through a whole maze of halls and stairs and courtyards. Again and again they heard parts of the great palace collapsing, sometimes quite close to them. Once, a huge arch came thundering down only a moment after they had passed through it. The queen was walking quickly. The children had to trot to keep up with her, but she showed no sign of fear. Diggory thought, she's wonderfully brave and strong. She's what I call a queen. I do hope she's going to tell us the story of this place. 
She did tell them certain things as they went along. That is the door to the dungeons, she would say, or that passage leads to the principal torture chambers, or this was the old banqueting hall where my great-grandfather bade seven hundred nobles to a feast and killed them all before they had drunk their fill. They had had rebellious thoughts. They came at last into a hall, larger and loftier than any they had yet seen. From its size and from the great doors of the far end, Diggory thought that now at last they must be coming to the main entrance. In this he was quite right. The doors were dead black, either ebony or some black metal which is not found in our world. They were fastened with great bars, most of them too high to reach and all too heavy to lift. He wondered how they would get out. The queen let go of his hand and raised her arm. She drew herself up to her full height and stood rigid. Then she said something which they couldn't understand, but it sounded horrid, and made an action as if she were throwing something towards the doors. And those high and heavy doors trembled for a second as if they were made of silk, and then crumbled away till there was nothing left of them but a heap of dust on the threshold. "'whistled Diggory. "'Has your master magician, your uncle, power like mine?' "'asked the queen, firmly seizing Diggory's hand again. "'But I shall know later. "'In the meantime, remember what you have seen. "'This is what happens to things and to people who stand in my way.' "'Much more light than they had yet seen in that country "'was pouring in through the now empty doorway, "'and when the queen led them out through it, "'they were not surprised to find themselves in the open air.' The wind that blew in their faces was cold, yet somehow stale. They were looking from a high terrace, and there was a great landscape spread out below them. Low down and near the horizon hung a great red sun, far bigger than our own sun. Diggory felt at once that it was also older than ours, a sun near the end of its life, weary of looking down upon that world. To the left of the sun and higher up, there was a single star, big and bright. Those were the only two things to be seen in the dark sky. They made a dismal group. And on the earth, in every direction, as far as the eye could reach, there spread a vast city in which there was no living thing to be seen. And all the temples, towers, palaces, pyramids, and bridges cast long, disastrous-looking shadows in the light of that withered sun. Once a great river had flowed through the city, but the water had long since vanished, and it was now only a wide ditch of grey dust. "'Look well on that which no eyes will ever see again,' said the queen. "'Such was Charn, the great city, the city of the king of kings, the wonder of the world, perhaps of all worlds. Does your uncle rule any city as great as this, boy?' No, said Diggory. He was going to explain that Uncle Andrew didn't rule any cities, but the Queen went on. It is silent now, but I have stood here when the whole air was full of the noises of charn, the trampling of feet, the creaking of wheels, the cracking of the whips and the groaning of slaves, the thunder of chariots and the sacrificial drums beating in the temples. I have stood here, but that was near the end, when the roar of battle went up from every street and the river of charn ran red. She paused and added, All in one moment, one woman blotted it out forever. Who? said Diggory in a faint voice, but he had already guessed the answer. I, said the queen, I, Jadis, the last queen, but the queen of the world. The two children stood silent, shivering in the cold wind. It was my sister's fault, said the queen. She drove me to it. May the curse of all the powers rest upon her forever. At any moment I was ready to make peace. Yes, and to spare her life too, if only she would yield me the throne. But she would not. Her pride has destroyed the whole world. Even after the war had begun, there was a solemn promise that neither side would use magic. But when she broke her promise, what could I do? Fool! as if she did not know that I had more magic than she. She even knew that I had the secret of the deplorable word. Did she think, she was always weakling, that I would not use it? What was it? said Diggory. That was the secret of secrets, said Queen Jadis. It had long been known to the great kings of our race that there was a word which, if spoken with the proper ceremonies, would destroy all living things except the one who spoke it. 
But the ancient kings were weak and soft-hearted, and bound themselves and all who should come after them with great oaths, never even to seek after the knowledge of that word. But I learned it in a secret place, and paid a terrible price to learn it. I did not use it until she forced me to it. I fought and fought to overcome her by every other means. I poured out the blood of my armies like water. Beast, muttered Polly. The last great battle, said the queen, raged for three days here in Charn itself. For three days I looked down upon it from this very spot. I did not use my power till the last of my soldiers had fallen, and the accursed woman, my sister, at the head of a rebels was halfway up those great stairs that led up from the city to the terrace. Then I waited till we were so close that we could see one another's faces. She flashed her horrible wicked eyes upon me and said, Victory! Yes, said I, victory, but not yours. Then I spoke the deplorable word. A moment later, I was the only living thing beneath the sun. But the people, gasped Diggory. What people, boy? asked the queen. All the ordinary people, said Polly, who'd never done you any harm, and the women, the children, and the animals. Don't you understand, said the queen, still speaking to Diggory. I was the queen. They were all my people. What else were they there for but to do my will? It was rather hard luck on them all the same, said he. I had forgotten that you are only a common boy. How should you understand reasons of state? You must learn, child, that what would be wrong for you or for any of the common people is not wrong in a great queen such as I. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. We must be freed from all rules. Ours is a high and lonely destiny. Diggory suddenly remembered that Uncle Andrew had used exactly those same words. But they sounded much grander when Queen Jadis said them. Perhaps because Uncle Andrew was not seven feet tall and dazzlingly beautiful. And what did you do then? asked Diggory. I had already cast strong spells on the hall where the images of my ancestors sit, and the force of those spells was that I should sleep among them, like an image myself, and need neither food nor fire, though it were a thousand years, till one came and struck the bell and awoke me. Was it the deplorable word that made the sun like that? asked Diggory. Like what? said Jadis. So big, so red, and so cold. It has always been so, said Jadis, at least for hundreds of thousands of years. Have you a different sort of sun in your world? Yes, it's smaller and yellower, and it gives a good deal more heat. The queen gave a long-drawn, ah, and Diggory saw on her face that same hungry and greedy look which he had lately seen on Uncle Andrew's. So, she said, yours is a younger world. She paused for a moment to look once more at the deserted city, and if she was sorry for all the evil she had done, she certainly didn't show it, and then said, Now, let us be going. It is cold here at the end of all the ages. Going where? asked both the children. Where? repeated Jadis in surprise. To your world, of course. Polly and Diggory looked at each other aghast. Polly had disliked the queen from the first, and even Diggory, now that he had heard the story, felt that he had seen quite as much of her as he wanted. Certainly, she was not at all the sort of person one would like to take home. And if they did like, they didn't know how they could. What they wanted was to get away themselves. But Polly couldn't get at her ring, and of course Diggory couldn't go without her. Diggory got very red in the face and stammered, Oh, oh, our world? Uh, the, the, the... They didn't know you wanted to go there. What else were you sent for, if not to fetch me, asked Jadis. I'm sure you wouldn't like our world at all, said Diggory. It's not her sort of place, is it, Polly? It's very dull. Not worth seeing, really. It will soon be worth seeing when I rule it, answered the queen. Oh, but you can't, said Diggory. It's not like that. They wouldn't let you, you know. The queen gave a contemptuous smile. Many great kings, she said, thought they could stand against the House of Charn, but they all fell, and their very names are forgotten. Foolish boy, do you think that I, with my beauty and my magic, will not have your whole world at my feet before a year has passed? Prepare your incantations, and take me there at once. 
This is perfectly frightful, said Diggory to Polly. Perhaps you fear for this uncle of yours, said Jadis. But if he honors me duly, he shall keep his life and his throne. I am not coming to fight against him. He must be a very great magician if he has found how to send you here. Is he king of your whole world, or only of part? He isn't king of anywhere, said Diggory. You are lying, said the queen. Does not magic always go with the royal blood? Who ever heard of common people being magicians? I can see the truth, whether you speak it or not. Your uncle is the great king, and the great enchanter of your world, and by his art he has seen the shadow of my face in some magic mirror or some enchanted pool, and for the love of my beauty he has made a potent spell which shook your world to its foundations and sent you across the vast gulf between world and world to ask my favor and to bring me to him. Answer me, is that not how it was? Well, not exactly, said Diggory. Not exactly, shouted Polly. Why, it's the absolute bosh from beginning to end! Minion, cried the queen, turning in rage upon Polly and seizing her hair at the very top of her head where it hurts most. But in doing so, she let go of both the children's hands. Now, shouted Diggory, and quick, shouted Polly. They plunged their left hands into their pockets. They did not even need to put the rings on. The moment they touched them, the whole of that dreary world vanished from their eyes. They were rushing upward, and a warm green light was growing nearer overhead. And that is the end of that chapter. Another quick drink break. How's everyone liking the story so far? It's one of my favorites, and it's very good. I like this one. I like C.S. Lewis and how he uh, used um, his own brand of mythology to tell uh, an allegory, as it is, um, about this entire world that he created called Narnia. Pretty cool. All right, here we go. The final chapter for this evening. Chapter 6. The beginning of Uncle Andrew's troubles. Let go, let go, screamed Polly. I'm not touching you, said Diggory. Then their heads came out of the pool, and once more, the sunny quietness of the wood between the worlds was all about them, and it seemed richer and warmer and more peaceful than ever after the staleness and ruin of the place they had just left. I think that if they had been given the chance, they would again have forgotten who they were and where they came from and would have lain down and enjoyed themselves half asleep listening to the growing of the trees. But this time there was something that kept them as wide awake as possible. For as soon as they had got out onto the grass, they found that they were not alone. The queen or the witch, whichever you like to call her, had come up with them, holding on fast by Polly's hair. That was why Polly had been shouting out, Let go! This proved, by the way, another thing about the rings which Uncle Andrew hadn't told Diggory because he didn't know it himself. In order to jump from world to world by using one of those rings, you don't need to be wearing or touching it yourself. It is enough if you are touching someone who is touching it. In that way, they work like a magnet. And everyone knows that if you pick up a pin with a magnet, any other pin which is touching the first pin will come too. Now that you saw her in the wood, Queen Jadis looked different. She was much paler than she had been, so pale that hardly any of her beauty was left, and she was stooped and seemed to be finding it hard to breathe, as if the air of that place stifled her. Neither of the children felt in the least afraid of her now. Let go, let go of my hair, said Polly. What do you mean by it? Here, let go of her hair, at once, said Diggory. They both turned and struggled with her. They were stronger than she, and in a few seconds they had forced her to let go. She reeled back, panting, and there was a look of terror in her eyes. Quick, Diggory, said Polly, change rings and into the home pool. Help, help, mercy, cried the witch in a faint voice, staggering after them. Take me with you. You cannot mean to leave me in this horrible place. It is killing me. It's a reason of state, said Polly spitefully, like when you killed all those people in your own world. To be quick, Diggory, they had put on their green rings, but Diggory said, Oh, bother, what are we to do? He couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the queen. Oh, don't be such an ass, said Polly. Ten to one, she's only shamming. Do come on. And then both children plunged into the home pool. It's a good thing we made that mark, thought Polly. But as they jumped, Diggory felt that a large cold finger and thumb had caught him by the ear. 
And as they sank down and the confused shapes of our own world began to appear, the grip of that finger and thumb grew stronger. The witch was apparently recovering her strength. Diggory struggled and kicked, but it was not of the least use. In a moment, they found themselves in Uncle Andrew's study. And there was Uncle Andrew himself, staring at the wonderful creature that Diggory had brought back from beyond the world. And well, he might stare. Diggory and Polly stared too. There was no doubt that the witch had got over her faintness. And now that one saw her in our own world, with ordinary things around her, she fairly took one's breath away. In Charn, she had been alarming enough. In London, she was terrifying. For one thing, they had not realized till now how very big she was. Hardly human was what Diggory thought when he looked at her, and he may have been right, for some say there is giantish blood in the royal family of Charn. But even her height was nothing compared with her beauty, her fierceness, and her wildness. She looked ten times more alive than most of the people one meets in London. Uncle Andrew was bowing and rubbing his hands and looking, to tell the truth, extremely frightened. He seemed a little shrimp of a creature beside the witch, and yet, as Polly said afterwards, there was a sort of likeness between her face and his, something in the expression. It was the look that all wicked magicians have, the mark which Jadis had said she could not find in Diggory's face. One good thing about seeing the two together was that you would never again be afraid of Uncle Andrew, any more than you'd be afraid of a worm after you had met a rattlesnake, or afraid of a cow after you had met a mad bull. Pooh, thought Diggory to himself. Him? A magician? Not much. Now she's the real thing. Uncle Andrew kept on rubbing his hands and bowing. He was trying to say something very polite, but his mouth had gone all dry so that he could not speak. His experiment with the rings, as he called it, was turning out more successful than he liked. For though he had dabbled in magic for years, he had always left all the dangers, as far as one can, to other people. Nothing at all like this had ever happened to him before. Then Jada spoke, not very loud, but there was something in her voice that made the whole room quiver. Where is the magician who has called me into this world? Ah, uh, ah, uh, madam, gasped Uncle Andrew. I am most honored, highly gratified, a most unexpected pleasure. If only I had the opportunity of making any preparations, I, I... "'Where is this magician, fool?' said Jadis. Uh, "'I am, madam. I hope you will excuse any, er, liberty these naughty children may have taken. I assure you there was no intention.' "'You!' said the queen in a still more terrible voice. Then, in one stride, she crossed the room, seized a great handful of Uncle Andrew's grey hair, and pulled his head back so that his face looked up into hers. Then she studied his face just as she had studied Diggory's face in the Palace of Charn. He blinked and licked his lips nervously all the time. At last she let him go, so suddenly that he reeled back against the wall. I see, she said scornfully. You are a magician, of a sort. Stand up, dog, and don't sprawl there as if you were speaking to your equals. How do you come to know magic? You are not of royal blood, I'll swear. Well, uh, not perhaps in the strict sense, stammered Uncle Andrew. Not exactly royal, ma'am. The Ketterleys are, however, a very old family, an old Dorsetshire family, ma'am. Peace, said the witch. I see what you are. You are a little peddling magician who works by rules and books. There is no real magic in your blood and heart. Your kind was made an end of in my world a thousand years ago. But here I shall allow you to be my servant. I should be most happy, delighted to be of any service, a p -p pleasure, I assure you. Peace, you talk far too much. Listen to your first task. I see we are in a large city. Procure for me at once a chariot, or a flying carpet, or a well-trained dragon, or whatever is usual for royal and noble persons in your land. Then bring me to places where I can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. I, I, I'll go and order a cab at once, gasped Uncle Andrew. Stop, said the witch, just as he reached the door. Do not dream of treachery. My eyes can see through walls and into the minds of men. They will be on you wherever you go. 
At the first sign of disobedience, I will lay such spells on you that anything you sit down on will feel like red-hot iron, and whenever you lie in bed, there will be invisible blocks of ice at your feet. Now go. The old man went out, looking like a dog with its tail between its legs. The children were now afraid that Jadis would have something to say to them about what had happened in the wood. As it turned out, however, she never mentioned it, either then or afterwards. I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was of a sort which cannot remember that quiet place at all, and however often you took her there, and however long you left her there, she would still know nothing about it. Now that she was left alone with the children, she took no notice of them either. And that was like her, too. In charm, she had taken no notice of Polly, till the very end, because Diggory was the one she wanted to make use of. Now that she had Uncle Andrew, she took no notice of Diggory. I expect most witches are like that. They are not interested in things or people unless they can use them. They are terribly practical. So there was silence in the room for a minute or two. But you could tell by the way Jadis tapped her foot on the floor that she was growing impatient. Presently, she said, as if to herself, What is the old fool doing? I should have brought a whip. She stalked out of the room in pursuit of Uncle Andrew without one glance at the children. Phew, said Polly, letting out a long breath of relief. And now I must get home. It's frightfully late. I shall catch it. Well, do, do come back as soon as you can, said Diggory. This is simply ghastly. Having her here, we must make some sort of plan. That's up to your uncle now, said Polly. It was he who started all this messing about with magic. All the same, you will come back, won't you? Hang it all. You can't leave me alone in a scrape like this. I shall go home by the tunnel, said Polly rather coldly. That'll be the quickest way. And if you want me to come back, hadn't you better say you're sorry? Sorry, exclaimed Diggory. Well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done? Oh, nothing, of course, said Polly sarcastically. Only nearly screwed my wrist off in that room with all the waxworks like a cowardly bully. Only struck the bell with the hammer like a silly idiot. Only turned back in the woods so that she had time to catch hold of you before we jumped into our own pool. That's all. Oh, said Diggory, very surprised. Well, all right. I'll say I'm sorry. And I really am sorry about what happened in the waxworks room. There, I've said I'm sorry, and now do be decent and come back. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Catterley who's going to sit on red-hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I'm bothered about is mother. Suppose that creature went into her room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in a rather different voice. All right, we'll call it Pax. I'll come back, if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel, and that dark place among the rafters, which had seemed so exciting and adventurous a few hours ago, seemed quite tame and homely now. We must now go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pit-a-pat as he staggered down the attic stairs, and he kept on dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was on the floor below, he locked himself in. And the very first thing he did was to grope in his wardrobe for a bottle and a wine glass, which he always kept hidden there where Aunt Letty could not find them. He poured himself out a glassful of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off at one gulp. Then he drew a deep breath. Upon my word, he said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting, and at my time of life. He poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can just remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the sort that made you hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a pattern on it and arranged his gold watch chain across the front. He put on his best frock coat, the one he kept for weddings and funerals. He got out his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vase of flowers, put there by Aunt Letty, on his dressing table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one, such as you couldn't buy today, out of the little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with a thick black ribbon and screwed it into his eye. 
and then he looked at himself in the mirror. Children have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. At this moment, Uncle Andrew was beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, A damn fine woman, sir, a damn fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of this superb creature. He felt as if he himself, by his magic, had called her out of unknown worlds. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass, you're a devilish, well-preserved fellow for your age, a distinguished-looking man, sir. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes. But he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock. That was why he had become a magician. He unlocked the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a hansom. Everyone had lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing room. There, as he expected, he found Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. Ah, Letitia, my dear, said Uncle Andrew, I, uh, have to go out. Just lend me five pounds or so. There's a good gal. Gel was the way he pronounced girl. No, Andrew, dear, said Aunt Letty in her firm, quiet voice, without looking up from her work. I've told you times without number that I will not lend you money. Now, pray, don't be troublesome, my dear gal, said Andrew. It's most important... You will put me in a deucedly awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Uncle Letty, looking him straight in the face, I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of grown-up kind behind those words. All you need to know about it is that Uncle Andrew, what between managing dear Letty's business matters for her and never doing any work and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been thirty years ago. My dear gal, said Uncle Andrew, you don't understand. I shall have some quite unexpected expenses today. I have to do a little entertaining. Come now, don't be tiresome. And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew? asked Aunt Letty. Ah, uh, a most distinguished visitor has just arrived. Distinguished fiddlestick, said Aunt Letty. There hasn't been a ring at the bell for the last hour. At that moment, the door was suddenly flung open. Aunt Letty looked round and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed, with bare arms and flashing eyes, stood in the doorway. It was the witch. And that is the end of the chapter. And thus, that is the end for the three chapters of this evening. Um, I believe I'm going to do the next reading on Saturday evening. Uh, and it will be at 7 o'clock. So if you are looking uh, to hear the rest of the story, or at least the continuation, the next three chapters, please uh, log on to Facebook and look for my uh, Facebook Live video. Um, otherwise, if you've missed uh, the first three chapters, or if you haven't heard these three from the beginning, you can go onto my YouTube page. You search my name, Chris Stalke, that's S-T-A-H-L-K-E, and uh, that will be the name of my YouTube channel, and the first three chapters are already posted on there. I made a mistake when I posted them on there. I um, uh, selected a certain choice for the video, and uh, it disabled the comments. So this time around, I won't make the same choice, and you'll be able to comment on the YouTube video as well. I hope you enjoyed this evening's reading, and please join me again Saturday evening. And again, if you're looking to uh, send a few tips my way, if that's your choice, um, you please um, private message me, and we'll talk about arrangements. Okay? Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure. Bye-bye!